You know, I've always been, I don't know why, but I've always been captivated by that statement of this way. He's not talking about a distance or a, or a direction. He's talking about believers. Any Christian, regardless of his direction where Paul was going, if he was going this way or that way, he wanted to have the authority to be able to arrest them, imprison them. And it wasn't just the men. Notice verse 2 says it was the men and the women. And he wanted to bring them bound to Jerusalem. And this, this chapter, we'll come back to it in a minute, but this chapter is where he has his meeting on the Damascus Road. Saul, like King Saul, King Saul of the Old Testament, all right, both of them are from the tribe of Benjamin. Both of them are from the tribe of Benjamin. Saul in the New Testament had the best of the best when it comes to religious education. I mean, he couldn't have had any better religious education. I say that with parentheses around it. He would talk about how in Acts 22, verse 3, I am verily a man which am a Jew, born in Tarsus, a city in Cilicia, yet brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers, and was zealous toward God as ye all are this day. In other words, Paul thought it was good to put men and women in prison because he was serving God. He was following the law. And Christians were, if you will, an enemy of the law, and so they need to go to jail. Think about it. This guy was so adamant and so... uh, uh, that's the word I want to use, adamant, and he was just so convinced that these were the enemy. And yet, he was obviously uh, very wrong in his assessment. Letter A, his passion, the blank is his passion for the Jews' religion. Turn over to chapter 26 of Acts. His passion for the Jews' religion. Think about our world today in which we live, okay? Do we have people that are passionate for their religion? Yes or no? Do we have passionate people for their religion? Yes. I mean, it's amazing what people will do in the name of religion. We heard about it last week from Pastor Getty about, in the Philippines, about people being crucified at Easter time. That's passion. Okay? I'm not saying it's the, it's the thing to do. I'm saying it's passion. Okay? So we have lots of passion. And we might look and say that maybe this is one of the original passionate religious people. But religious isn't what we're after. We're after a relationship. Okay? Notice what he said about himself, Acts 26, 4. Paul said, My manner of life from my youth which was at the first mine own nation at Jerusalem, know all the Jews, which knew me from the beginning, verse 5, if they would testify that after the most straightest sect of our religion, I lived a Pharisee. So before he was converted, before he became a Christian, Saul was so prideful that he was educated and he was faultless in obeying the law of Moses. He was, the, he was the devout of the devout, if you will, following the law to the T. And he not only followed the law, but he also followed the extra interpretations that were added to the law and the embellishments that were added to the law as well. I mean, he was a standout, if you will. He was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. You can find that in Philippians 3, 4 through 6. We won't turn there for time. But he was a Pharisee of the Pharisee, the best of the best. He was a legalist in any, from any stretch of the imagination. He lived by the law and for the law. Okay? So his passion. Letter B, his persecution of the Christian believers. Let's turn over to Galatians chapter 1, please. Persecution of the Christian believers. So, Judaism is a religion. 
And Paul was following it to the T. So anybody that did not follow Judaism was then in his mind a threat. And all threats must be eliminated. Okay? And it wasn't just go over and tell them to be quiet and quit handing out tracts or, you know, leave me alone. It was a little further than that in Paul's mind. Okay? Galatians chapter 1 and verse number 13. For ye have heard of my conversation. Okay? That's not talking about his his uh, speaking, it's talking about his way of life, his manner of life. You have heard about my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted who? The church of God. You know, if, if, it, was in, if it was 2024 and he was still lost, he would not like this meeting. He would come into this meeting and he would say, okay, I've got a letter here from uh, the prime minister or whoever. And uh, uh, out, you know, you're out. You're heading to jail right now. Because we would have been viewed as uh, a threat. In, in his estimation, that's what he says. Okay, verse 14. And profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in my own nation, in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the, notice the next word. Maybe if you'd circle words in your Bible or underline them, this would be a good one. If not, that's fine. But, but don't overlook that. Tradition. And you know, it's amazing. You were just talking about this today. Tradition of my fathers. It just hit me. Sorry. I'm, that's a, Anyway. Just because my father taught me something doesn't mean it's right. Now think about this. Paul was following the tradition of his fathers. The problem is the tradition was wrong. If we're following tradition over truth, that's a big problem. And that's exactly what Paul was doing. He was only following what he had been taught. But sometimes what we've been taught isn't necessarily the truth. So how do we know if it's true or not? We go to the scriptures. We could, go to, we could go to the pastor and say, what do you think about this? But he better go to the Bible and say, well, here's what the Bible says. To the best of his ability take, is, is taking you to the scripture. It doesn't say everything in the Bible for everything in life. Okay? Not every decision can you make can you say, here's a chapter and a verse for it. There's definitely biblical principles. But the the difference is, Paul said, I was zealous about tradition. All right? And this is why we always want to preach the gospel, even in a Baptist church that stands on the word of God, because we never we don't know who's going to be in the meeting that is basing their eternal destiny on a tradition and not on truth. Okay? And Paul was definitely someone who said, tradition is where it's at. And he was, very, uh, he was very passionate about it, okay? So kind of got on that for a moment, all right? Let's go back to Acts chapter 7. His persecution of the believers, we're still on that. Let's go back to Acts chapter 7. Basically, his goal was to destroy Christianity. Can you think of anything? Can you think of any other group that's doing that today? Well, yeah, it's happening, and it's probably not just one group. So we're not going to just pick on one group, but there's probably, we might be able to come up with one major group. So again, there's nothing new under the sun, right? <laughs> and it's all an attack on truth. Because, see, truth sets us free. And Satan doesn't want anybody to be set free. Satan wants everybody to be under bondage. But God loves everyone. And God wants everyone to be set free. And 
I'm so thankful for that. Where do we find him first? Well, here we are, Acts chapter 7. Saul is mentioned. The Bible says, Acts 7, 58, and cast him out of the city. That's not talking about Saul. The him there is Stephen. And stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. So Stephen is the first martyr who was standing for Christ, and he was killed for it. Think about that. How little we've had to stand for. Okay, I'll just make it about me. How little I've had to stand for. I'll be 51 in June if the Lord lets me live that long or doesn't return. And I've never had anything close to that, what we just read. Here's a man who was ripped out of the city and stoned to death because of his stand for God and for Christ. And who's right there at the, at the, at the stoning? Saul. Many believe there was... You know, possibly he was some kind of a leader. He obviously was around. He didn't stop it. I'm sure he was for it based on other passages of Scripture that we've been reading. But he did everything he could to oppose Christianity in the name of Jesus. Several verses of Scripture. Acts 22.4 And I persecuted this way unto death, binding and delivering into prisons, both men and women. Acts twenty two nineteen. And I said, Lord, they know that I imprisoned and beat in every synagogue them that believed on thee. Acts 26, 9 through 11. I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. So contrary, right? That means opposing which thing I also did in Jerusalem, verse 10, and many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priest, and when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. So they're, they're dead already, right? But yet Saul says, I'm still gonna, I'm still gonna make, I'm still gonna make it even worse. I'm going, to, I'm going to give my voice against them, even after they've already been killed. I punished them oft in every synagogue, compelled them to blaspheme, and being seemingly mad against them, I persecuted them even under strange cities. So Paul wanted to go beyond local persecution to also wherever he could travel to. And that's where we find in Acts chapter 9, where we began a moment ago. So, number one, Saul's tradition, quickly. Number two, let's go back to chapter 9, Saul's transformation. Everyone likes a good before and after story, right? Many times it's a picture. You know, it could be um, a renovated house, maybe. Look, at this is what it looked like before, this is what it looks like after, okay? Uh, maybe it's, it could be uh, a weight loss story, okay? It's definitely not usually the other way around. Weight gain. I could show you a picture from before I started taking these steroids. Man, if you don't want to take steroids, if you want to bulk up, well, no, don't take, I'm not going to, that's a bad thing to say. Just go take steroids. Uh, the, good, the good thing I didn't say that, but uh, I almost did it. But uh, anyway... Weight loss, right? Before and after. Everybody likes a transformation story, whatever it may be, okay? Maybe it's even taking an old car and fixing it up and shining it up and before and after. Well, that's really what we have in the life of Saul. We've tried to paint him biblically, even in his own words. He says, this was who I was, but it didn't stay that way. And what was, the, what was it that transformed Saul? Well, I, you know, sometimes I think we look at maybe even his life and we think, you know, there's not, I have nothing to compare to him. I mean, that, that wasn't me. I, it was my testimony. 
But you know what? As I was meditating on this and thinking about this, it doesn't matter if your name is Saul, Ben, Alex, Jeff, Medi, Martin, Barry, you know, Ross. We all come to Christ the same way. The transformation story is the same. And it really, it's interesting. Letter A, it really captivated me. I didn't write this curriculum. But I really learned, I've really learned a lot just by studying the first lesson. Letter A, he heard the voice of the Lord. That's exactly how I came to Christ. I don't know about you. <laughs> but if you're, if you're saved, that's how you came to Christ too. Okay, I wasn't walking down, you know, Columbia and, you know, and all of a sudden, you know, a light shined from heaven. But you know what I was doing? You know what happened to me? I opened the Bible. And God spoke to me through his word in a Sunday school class. My Sunday school teacher taught the Bible to me every week. All of them. And I don't say that boastfully. I just say that, that I'm thankful. But it doesn't matter what our name is. If we're on our way to heaven, it's because we heard we, we, we heard it this morning in church. We heard of the voice of the Lord. It doesn't mean we had, it has to be an audible voice. But we heard the voice of the Lord say, I love you. I died for you. Now we see in the life of Saul, verse number 3, Acts 9, 3, and as he journeyed, he came near Damascus and suddenly, he, why was he on his way to Damascus? He was on his way to Damascus to persecute Christians. And the Bible says that a light shined from heaven, verse 3, he fell to the earth, he heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, who art thou, Lord? That's a good, that's an interesting statement there. Who? Who? First, it was who? Who are you? <laughs> but notice what he said. Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Verse 6, and he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what? So first he said who, and now he says what? Wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless. They heard as well, but they but seeing no man. Paul later would testify in Galatians 1, 11, and 12 that he would receive the gospel by the revelation of Jesus Christ. What is the gospel? It's the good news, isn't it? Of what three things? The death of Jesus, the burial of Jesus, and the resurrection of Jesus. I, I want to challenge you with this tonight. I'm not asking you to say, yes, I can, or no, I can't. Can you explain the gospel to someone? If I were to come up to you and you have no idea who I am, and for some reason I just say, can you tell me what is the gospel? I want to encourage us. I want to challenge us. Every one of us here, we should be able to explain the gospel. But why? Because there is no other way to go to heaven, except the gospel, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There is no other way. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, Paul said. This is Paul now, right? Which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand. And then he explains it, verse 3. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. Here it is. Christ died for our sins. So I didn't, I'm not, don't, don't, I, you know, earlier we said, go to the pastor, he better point you to the Bible. This is the passage. This is one of the key passages. There's others, but this is a big one. 1 Corinthians 15, 1. If somebody says, what is the gospel? You don't even have to have it memorized. Just go to 1 Corinthians 15, 1 and start showing them. You know what? Here's, what? here's what the Bible says the gospel is. And remember, what language is stronger, yours or the Bible's? Hmm? Whose language is stronger, mine or the Bible's? God's word's the stronger. 
There's no man or woman that has a stronger word than God's word. So it's not necessarily what do I believe, it's what does God's word say. And may we always think that way. Yes, we believe it, but what does God's word say? God's word says the gospel is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And notice what he said. He said, I declare it unto you. You don't have to be a pastor to declare the gospel. By the way, you don't have to be a pastor to preach. Don't let anybody ever tell you that. Only pastors can preach. That's not true. Okay? And we could say a lot more there, but we'll just, we'll just move on. All right? The gospel is the power of God. Let's look at this one. Romans 1. Romans 1. What is the gospel? I'm just, we'll get through the lesson, and we'll get through and, and, and right on time, I think. But I want to my, my, I want to just pause here just for another moment. And I want to challenge you, I want to implore you to be able to tell someone about the gospel. What it is, what it means to you, and, uh, and, and, and where it is. This is, also, this is also why it's good to memorize verses of the Bible. All right? You know, maybe you're not able to carry around your Bible with you everywhere you go. And maybe you will I get asked a question. You know, who knows? Uh, and you won't be able to pull out your Bible or even your phone, but you'll be able to remember, you know, uh, the other day I was reading in the Bible, or, or the Bible says this, that the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it changed my life. You know, the Bible was given to us not just for information, right? The Bible was given to us for Transformation. How did Saul get transformed? He heard the voice of the Lord. How did you get transformed? You heard the voice of the Lord. No difference. No difference. God speaks to us through his word. He speaks to us through his spirit. He speaks to us through other believers. Romans 1.16. It's a great verse to memorize. For I am not ashamed... Who wrote this, by the way? Paul. (laughs) How about it? This is the guy who was killing people about it. Now he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it, the gospel, is the power of God. It is not the baptismal tank. He said, It is the power of God unto salvation. It's not the baptismal tank. That is not the power of God unto salvation. Doing good is not the power of God unto salvation. Giving in the offering is not the power of God unto salvation. These are all good things, but it's not the power of God unto salvation. Unto salvation. What is, though, the gospel? What's the gospel, church? The death of Jesus Christ. The burial of Jesus Christ. And praise God, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that's not because the pastor told you that. It's because it's in God's word. Right? And, uh, and I'm thankful that it's in God's Word. So, it is the power of God into salvation. The Holy Spirit convicted you, convicted me, of my need of a Savior. I heard the voice of the Lord. Maybe I didn't hear it audibly, but I heard it right in here, as loud as I could hear anything else. Ben, you need to be saved. Ben, you're a sinner. You need Jesus. Titus 3, 4, and 5, but after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared. The kindness and love of God our Savior. Because of that, it appeared, it appeared to man. Excuse me. And that follows right up with, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. 1 Timothy 2.4, who will have all men to be saved? Does God only want certain people getting saved? No. Will everyone get saved? No. But God wants all men to be saved. That's right there. No one is beyond the power of of the saving, beyond the saving power of Jesus Christ. No one. 
We're talking about a murder of Christians, and yet he was not beyond the saving power of Jesus Christ. The gospel is transformational. We said that earlier. The power to change lives immediately. How many of you have ever sang the song Amazing Grace? How many of you know who wrote Amazing Grace? Give it a try. Saba? Do you know who wrote it? Oh, sorry, to put you on the spot. Okay. Anybody want to try? John Newton. Sorry, Saba, I didn't mean to embarrass you. John Newton. Now, anybody know about, anybody know anything? I'm not going to, we're not going to ask everybody to speak about it, but does anybody know a little, does anybody know anything about John Newton's life besides the fact that he wrote Amazing Grace? There you go. We'll just stop right with that. And that's, that's exactly right. He wasn't someone who was thinking about writing about the amazing grace of God all of his life. He did. He captained a, shaves, a, a, a slave ship. He was actually a slave trader. I mean, none of us in here would say that's a good thing to do at all. But God got a hold of his attention. And uh, there was a, a storm, a really bad storm that took place on the sea. We've got our seamen right over here. Brother Mehdi. And God got a hold of his attention, and God saved him. He, he repented and turned to Christ. And he would write, uh, someday write, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound, that saved a wretch like me. Now you kind of know what he was talking about. But his sin is no different than yours or mine. He heard the voice of the Lord. B, he saw the vision of his new mission. Verse nine of Acts, or, or verse six of Acts nine, he said, "What wilt thou have me to do?" So as soon as he, as soon as he, he says, "Who are you?" and he recognized Jesus as the Lord. This is amazing, isn't it? I mean, he, he's still blind, honestly. He's blind. He won't, see, he won't see for three days. But he immediately says, what do I do now? When we say, you are Jesus, you are Lord, then we should say, what do, what do you want me to do? What is that? That is surrender. It doesn't mean that you have to, it doesn't mean that all of us will, will write scripture. Obviously, we're not going to write scripture, but it doesn't mean that it's going to fit exactly like this. But what, it, what it's showing us here is there's a surrender. And, and again, I ask, I ask us tonight, um, are we surrendered? Are we, am I surrendered? What would happen in my life if I consistently ask God, what would you have me to do? You know, I'll be honest, there's times in my life where I already know what to do. But I was just talking to Brother June and Brother Matthias and about these, uh, this little prayer thing that they have on their lapel over here. And I think you said, pray first. That's the theme at Manitoba this year at uh, Pemina Valley Baptist. Wow, well, you know, he said that to me, and I thought, ooh, how many times do I pray first, or how many times do I just do it? Because I already know what to do. Ouch! <laughs> None, it doesn't matter how long you've been studying the Bible, nobody knows what to do all the time. We need God. There's a brand new Christian, and he says, what do you want me to do? You know, sometimes I think we just need to pause and say, God, what do you want me to do? And I'm going to wait until you tell me I'm going to wait till you open this door, kick it open for me. I'm going to trust you with this. Anyway, steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Psalm 37, 23. Now, you know, I'm going to cut out a little bit of this, but I'm not going to cut out this part. Because God speaks to us. Remember what I said earlier. How many of you remember? God speaks to us 
through his, what is this? His word. He speaks to us through his word. He speaks to us by his spirit. And he also speaks to us through other Christians. Okay. Now, some of you know a little bit of the story here, but maybe not all of us. So Saul's a brand new Christian. He's just been murdering Christians, men and women, throwing them in jail. Everybody knows that in the church. Anybody that sees Saul come and look out. And so God says, hey, Acts chapter 9, if you're there. He knocks on a, uh, a, young, uh, a gentleman's heart. In fact, he has a vision. His name is Ananias. And God says to Ananias, verse 11 of Acts 9, Arise, go into the street, which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarshish. For behold, he prayeth. And he tells him, he's seen you coming. <laughs> I mean, anybody that says the Bible is not exciting, They're, they had never read it. I just try, I try to think about this every time I read it. You know, you know, I'm thinking, you know, I'm sitting in my chair at home and I'm having a vision and God says to me like this, you know, hey, you're Ananias and, you know, you're going to go, this guy's praying and he sees you coming. And by the way, his name is Saul. And in, even, in a, even in a dream, I would know, that's no good. <laughs> I don't want to talk to Saul. <laughs> and notice what it says. Verse 13, he talks to the Lord. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man. He's evil. He's got authority of the chief priest to bind anyone that calls on your name. Verse 15, but the Lord said unto him, go thy way. Look down at verse 17, please. And Ananias, what's the next three words? Went his way. And what's the next statement? Entered into the house. Wow. He's definitely no Jonah. You know, going to Nineveh. Ooh, no, no thanks. Hey, and I, Ananias, go, to, go, go, go see Saul. He's over at Judas' house. He's praying, and he's seen you coming in, in a vision. Wow. Talk about someone who heard and obeyed the voice of the Lord. Ananias should be on the top 10 list of anybody in the Bible. Honestly, think about it. Because he was going to talk to a guy that could kill him. And yet he obeyed the Lord. Wow. So, tradition, transformation, and lastly, number three, Saul's testimony. His testimony. If you are a believer tonight, you have a testimony. Our, our testimony should stand as proof of the power of the gospel and our salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul's testimony was evident, not just in public, but also in private. Whether it was a synagogue, whether it was a public gathering, or even a prison cell. Paul's message was the same. Be ye followers of me as I also am of Christ. 1 Corinthians 11. 1. Letter A, we see his public preaching. His public preaching. He took advantage of every opportunity he could. Acts 20.20. 20, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house. I believe God gives us opportunities that, that we miss. Let's not miss an opportunity. Here's an invitation if you need some. We have them here tonight. You can give one of these to someone. It's inviting them to the March 31st service. Let's not miss an opportunity, even this week, uh, to declare the gospel. It's a responsibility, but it's also a privilege. Jesus would give several times this, what we call the Great Commission. 
Matthew 28, 18 to 20, Mark 16, 15. These are, these are the words of Jesus right before he would go back to heaven. If we think about it, it was kind of the last thing that he talked about. What was the last thing that he talked about was take the gospel message into this world, into every creature. His public preaching, letter B, his personal witnessing. His personal witnessing. Acts 22, or excuse me, Acts 26, 22. Acts 26, 22. Having therefore obtained help of God. Hmm, isn't that something? Look, don't, don't, don't read quickly over that. Having obtained the help of God. And, and that same help is, is available for all of us tonight. What do you need God's help with? I know it's not just for witnessing, which is what we're talking about, but I'm sure we all need God's help in many areas of our life, don't we? But here we see that he obtained it. But notice, having therefore obtained help of God, notice the next two words, I continue. There you go. That's a neat word, huh? Maybe we'll have a theme about that. <laughs> I continue. What was he continuing in? It's right there. Witnessing. I like this statement. Both to small, right? Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. <laughs> I witnessed to the small, but he also said, I witnessed to the great. Obviously, that's not talking about size. It's talking about maybe people of importance, maybe uh, no, well-known people and people that aren't known. It doesn't matter. He says, I witnessed to everybody. Uh, where was I reading from? 26, 22. Small and great, saying none other things than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come. Wow. All backgrounds, all whatever. Small communities, large communities, small environments, big environments. He, he preached the message. He continued it. God helped him. And God will help you and God will help me. Charles Spurgeon preached to thousands in London every Sunday, yet he started his ministry as a teenager by passing out gospel tracts and teaching a Sunday school class. When he began to give short addresses to the Sunday school, God blessed his ministry of the word. He was invited to preach in obscure places across the English countryside, and he used every opportunity to honor the Lord. He was faithful in the small things, and God trusted him with the greater things. You and I may never have an audience of somebody who is important, powerful, influential, but we're going to come across people tomorrow I guarantee you, we will. Unless you're going to be home all day. <laughs> and maybe you will be, that's fine. I'm experiencing that a lot and praying that I don't have to experience it much longer. But I even know tomorrow, hey, I have places to go tomorrow, and that's a big thing for me. And you know what I need to be? I need to be ready. Because it isn't about me, but it's about the message that I have that was given to me. And like Paul I want to be able to say, I continue. God is helping me. And I continue this day witnessing to anyone and everyone. That's my translation. Anyone and everyone. We can hand that grocery store clerk a gospel track. We can give one to the barber or the beautician. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. In conclusion, Saul of Tarsus, he was a persecutor of Christians. He was a blasphemer. 
And yet he heard the voice of the Lord. And he said, who are you? And then he said, what will you have me to do? Paul's conversion gives us these two reflections. Number one, has there ever been a transformation in your life? You say, well, I don't have that story. You don't have to have that story. See, these these aren't stories for us to read and say, oh, how come that never happened to me? If you've accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior, putting your faith and trust in Him and Him alone, you have a story. And it's a beautiful one. It's your story. And it's transformational. Number two, are we faithfully sharing the message of salvation with others? I'm I'm praying that this week we would have an opportunity to specifically talk about the gospel with at least one person each. There's about uh, 500 people in here. Not quite. There's about, I don't know, 30 to 40 of us in here tonight. Maybe more. Brother Kim, how many of us are in here? Please. Just right here. 48 people. Can you imagine if at least 48 people heard the gospel this week? If we could tell for one person only each... That's 48 people that would not have heard the gospel. So what do we do about it? We pray. And we say, God, give me that opportunity this week to talk about how your gospel changed me.